at the moment. What I need to do is I need to be able to stand at Sin Bio Beta in 2026 and throw kilograms of product into the crowd and say, keep it, it's only worth $9 a kilo. Iran, what's going on? Welcome back. Welcome back. I feel so relaxed and refreshed from our holiday break. One week. Wow. What a week. How about you? How do you feel? I feel pretty good. We both traveled a little bit, kind of in the same direction. You went to Montreal. I went up to the Adirondacks. Tell me what was the highlight of your trip to Montreal? The highlight was on the way to Montreal, we stopped by Shrewen Lake, where you're based. And it was so great to be with your family by the lake. Thank you so much for grilling some burgers. That was fun. It was a lot of fun to go out on the lake with your family and your son, Felix, was driving and we were just chilling. My son was there. He's three years old. He, I think, was a little overwhelmed by the experience because it was a little bit faster than he's experienced. And I think he was feeling a little bit seasick, but he's all cuddled up with me. So that was really a good highlight. And I would say, of course, Montreal's beautiful. I encouraging you to go, Carl. You would love it. Everyone speaks French. You speak French. The food is incredible. There was not one bad meal. And I went to the grocery store and went to the refrigerator case for the ready-made foods. And that food was delicious as well. It's just a good vibe. It's the fastest way to get to Europe without going to Europe, I say, because it's very French. And the vibe was great because it was a jazz fest. So lots of music. It's a good break. I will say, though, being on vacation with a three-year-old is a lot of work. So I did feel exhausted after my vacation for a day. But then we got another day just to relax. And my relax is work, I guess. So sad. <laughs> You know, when work is play, then it's not work. Yes. But uh, I mean, I have been to Montreal three, maybe four times. There was a quote from the show Hacks where they're like, the main characters go to a Montreal Comedy Fest. She's like, sounds like Paris, looks like Hartford. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny, but I do love Montreal. I haven't been in a while. We have been talking about driving up to Quebec and just cruising around Southern Quebec, which is not that far from Shroon Lake. But I'm fascinated. I mean, I love the food up there. And the fact that you guys speak so highly of the food is something I'm going to pay more attention to the next time we go up there. It's something we've been overdue for. So when we connected after the holiday, I was asking you what you were doing and you were telling me about a 48 hour fast. Did you not eat for 48 hours? Why did you do that? And what happened? So the only thing I ate for two days was coffee and not even a lot of it and water. I did it because... I do intermittent fasting, meaning that some days, as you know, I'll only eat dinner. I love doing that. And I wanted to see what it would be like to do 48 hours. And I didn't really feel hungry at all. I don't know if I reached the point where my mind was clear or I was more focused. I think the worst experience of the fast was going to the grocery store at hour 44. I had to go shopping. Mm -hmm. Felix and I are in New York City. And it wasn't that I wanted to buy everything in the store because I wasn't hungry. It was more, I was really distracted. I found myself being distracted and going down rabbit holes, looking at ingredients of foods. And Whole Foods is not a good place to go when you're 44 hours into a 48 hour fast. But I think it was great. I felt like at the end of it, I could definitely do three days, meaning 72 hours. And the other reason besides just the personal challenge of it is we know that after 24 hours, there's a significant benefit to fasting. After 48 hours, the benefit's even greater. And after 72 hours, you start to trigger all these really interesting processes in your body. Probably most notably is autophagy, where your body starts eating up cells that are just not working very well. So it is supposed to be very, very healthy to do this on occasion. Like I said, I didn't feel that hungry and I would definitely do it again. I'm planning on doing it again. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think that's incredible. All my fasting experience has been from Ramadan and that's always a challenge, but you also eat a lot very early in the morning and then you break fast and sometimes it's a little bit harder because the days are longer, but you didn't do that. You didn't eat a bunch of food and then you had your last meal, a normal dinner, and then you went into it. But I think it is very interesting because when we are talking to our longevity friends that are in the space, they do point to intermittent fasting as a way to help increase lifespan. And as you get older, you have less of an appetite. I noticed that as well. Since I'm reading a lot more about olfaction, your sense of smell actually fades as you get older too. So food doesn't taste as good. So that's interesting. 
But when you were talking about intermittent fasting, just not eating as much, it just reminded me of the world of Ozempic, how people are eating less. And I think that's a very interesting place to look because I'm really happy with my health and in terms of losing weight or everything like that. But I'm just curious, does being on Zepic increase your focus because you're not thinking about food? Do you have more time? Are you more productive? So I wonder what the research is on that because there's people that say, oh, I don't sleep as much. I don't eat as much. And then I have all this time to do other things. And I'm like, hmm, I do spend a lot of time eating and sleeping. I do enjoy eating, but is that because, first of all, it's probably my gut microbiome telling me it wants food. So that's probably what it is. But with intermittent fasting or using like Ozempic, does it curtail the hunger? And then you're just thinking of other things. But if any of our listeners are taking Ozempic or they are 48 hour fasting or intermittent fasting, let us know how the experience is going for you and if you've experienced significant health benefits. Yeah, I think that's great. I would love to have someone come on who uses Ozempic because I want to know the same thing that you just asked. Does it increase your focus? There are all these unintended positive consequences of Ozempic use. And I just got a 340 slide deck from Stifle about the weight loss category, which is going to be at some point days of study to go through it. I'll share it with you. Thanks. I want to see what the research is showing. I don't know if this was an unexpected development. I certainly don't feel like I saw it coming. I felt like biotech was working on weight loss for a really long time. And here we are with this being this trillion dollar drug category, potentially creating the first trillion dollar drug companies and really having all these positive effects, decreasing addiction, potentially heart protecting mm -hmm. effects. I want to know if focus is a part of that. So I'm super, super excited to learn more about that. And maybe there's just someone in our community we can get on here to talk about the Ozempic effect. Yeah, absolutely. I think we could put our bat signal out on LinkedIn and be like, who's taking Ozempic? Come on the pod. And I know some people, so I'll just ask them more directly if they would be willing just to come on and talk about their experience. And actually, just to also clarify for listeners who might not know, and we're saying Ozempic and Ozempic is a diabetes drug, but then we go be as a weight loss drug. Same molecules, same formulation, but just different concentration. So people that are taking Wegovi or Ozempic, but they're taking it for different purposes and there's just different concentrations. But speaking of weight loss, the trend in increased weight has been because people are consuming more food. We live more sedentary lifestyles and the foods that people are consuming are high in fat and high in sugar. Yes, that's a big contribution to it. But people are working on, of course, alternative sugars, alternative sweeteners. Some of them have their own side effects and their own negative effects. But there is one sweetener that we are very excited to talk about. And we've talked about it before is Oobly. Oobly has created this delicious chocolate. And we actually have some free chocolates to give away to our listeners. Just go into our show notes and click on the form and fill in your information and we'll send you some chocolates. You should definitely try it. But Oobly chocolates get the majority of their sweetness from sweet proteins. This is so interesting to us because we're always talking about how we can impart new functionality on different biology. And this is a new way of experiencing sweetness from a new type of molecule, not carbohydrates, but from proteins. And it's derived from this rare fruit called the oobly fruit from West Africa, which is very interesting too, because to me, this sounds like bioprospecting. So you're finding unique plants from around the world that have properties that we need to help us live healthier lives. And what this fruit has done has tricked evolution to develop sweetness from a protein structure. So it has no impact on blood sugar, insulin, or the gut microbiome. So it's an ideal sweet solution for modern food system that's overladen with carbohydrate-based sugar. And Oobly sustainably produces sweet proteins via fermentation, which we talk about a lot. So that's a very unique way to experience a product made through fermentation. So when we're talking to our listeners about what's going on in biotech, this is a result of this new bioeconomy. Fill in the form, try Oobly, let us know how you like it, let them know how you like it, and help us grow the bioeconomy with Oobly. So I think one of the notes there is that Oobly produces this sugar via fermentation. And today we're going to be talking to Michelle Stansfield of Cauldron, which is a biomanufacturing company based in Australia. Oh, yeah. I heard of Cauldron recently because I saw 
Michelle Speak at Symbio Beta. How do you meet Michelle? How do you know her? So I also met Michelle at Symbio Beta. I was lucky enough to be invited to a dinner hosted by Cauldron and Main Sequence Ventures. And Main Sequence Ventures is Australia's biggest deep tech venture firm. I believe they're funded by the Australian Sovereign Fund, and they've been very active in investing in deep tech, climate tech, and biotech. And the person who invited me to the dinner was Phil Morrill, who I've known for many years and stay in contact with. We met at Symbio Beta. We talked to each other a couple times of the year. I'm a big fan of Phil. I think Phil is a big fan of us. He loves a podcast. And so he invited us to a dinner before Symbio Beta that was put on by Main Sequence and Cauldron. And I met Michelle. Michelle gave a presentation about her company, Cauldron, how she ended up there and what Cauldron does. And I think with that, we should just let Michelle take it away. Michelle Stansfield, I'm so happy to have you on the Grow Everything podcast. Pumped to be here. So excited. One very quick anecdote. Australia and Chile are about the same when it comes to how far down south they are. So when you podcast in by post in by a beta, you weren't sure where it was when it comes to which country was further south. Chile and Australia are about the same. Did I say that to you? Was that something we talked about? No, it's in your pod. Just in by a beta pod. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting because we just were made aware that the Patagonia region is opening a biotech hub. And we have a friend who runs the Genome Center in Sydney, and he's from Argentina. And I've showed him the job listing and he said, oh, it's very cold there. Always. It's always very cold there. <sighs> so, uh... Yeah. So tell me about Cauldron. What's your mission? What is Cauldron? And what's the potential impact of what you guys are doing? Cauldron is a biomanufacturing company with a mission to realize the full potential of precision fermentation. And we do that through unlocking price parity. We're we're finally the company that will unlock cost of goods for biomanufactured goods. And I guess we do that because we have this proprietary hyperfermentation technology. And I think it's becoming quite well known within narrative, which is an adaptation of continuous fermentation. We're going to bring continuous fermentation into the mainstream, which ultimately is going to drive down cost of goods considerably. Okay, so let's unpack all of that a little bit so that people who don't know anything about precision fermentation, what that means, what does parity mean, and how are you guys doing this? What's hyperfermentation? I mean, let's start at the top. What do people need to know about precision fermentation? What is it? So precision fermentation is a technology that has been used in mainstream pharmaceutical for a very long time. It's how insulins make it. When you use an engineered microbe to create a molecule of choice, it may be a protein, it could be like insulin, it could be a protein like egg white, it could be a plastic, or it could be a fiber. But these microbes are fundamentally, these microbes are create factories for these new generation of molecules that is more sustainable manufacturing technically. We really believe it will drive the next industrial revolutions. And when you talk about parity from a cost point of view, parity with what? Okay, so Cauldron is a company that wants to unlock precision fermentation for high volume, lower cost goods. So we're talking about egg white protein, we're talking about plastics, we're talking about fibers for food, for the garments and sustainable aviation fuels. So what we need to do is we really need to drive down the cost of goods so it compares with conventional agricultural methods. And we're just not there yet. There's a lot of very smart people in the world who have these technologies, but they just haven't been able to compete with conventional production methods. When you say you guys have a hyper-fermentation technology that competes with continuous fermentation, what are both of those things? So hyperfermentation is a continuous um, fermentation technology. And ultimately, if you think of any manufacturing method, when you go from piece by piece assembly to an entire assembly line or a moving assembly line, it ultimately drives up productivity. You get more product, which then drives down cost of goods because it's getting more product per energy unit that you expend in the manufacture. So continuous fermentation really changes the way that we move and we manufacture through biology. So when you think about incumbent technology, what they do is in a big stainless steel vat, they add sugar and microbe and a couple of little and of a broker or a couple of vitamins. And they grow those microbes until basically they're senescent, until they're older and they've eaten all the sugar. What we can do with continuous fermentation is we can feed them in a manner that keeps them at a certain age. So 
we all know that teenagers are a lot more productive than old people. So we can tailor manufacture so it keeps the yeast at a specific, very productive age. And we can do that for a very long period of time. We don't have to stop the fermenters and clean them every time. We can just keep going. How did you end up at Cauldron? Because Cauldron is a new company, right? Cauldron is a startup. We were incorporated in November 2022. We did raise our seed round in March 2023. But we're a company that has acquired technology that's 35 years old. So we're a startup with 35 years worth of R&D. That's amazing. And how did you end up there? What were you doing before Cauldron? I was working for that company with 35 years worth of R&D. So I was the general manager of a company called Agri Technology, and they were a family-owned company out of Australia. And the founders of that company, they built the ICI bioreactors. His name was David McLennan, and he always wanted to use microbes to feed the world. In the 70s, probably long before you and I were born, he realized that batch fermentation would never, ever get the cost down enough to feed the world using microbes. So he started developing a continuous fermentation technology back in the 70s. So our first recipe is literally written in the 1970s by hand and it's photocopied. It's great. So he developed that over 35 years. And I joined the team in 2012. I had been working in vaccine manufacture, all sorts of exciting things, and moved to the country where this company is based and started working with them because I could see that it was really going to work on food security, which is one of my personal vendettas. But they weren't keen to build factories. I thought this technology was amazing, but without the factories, it really means nothing. So I was challenged to orchestrate an exit for that company. And I was talking to Main Sequence Ventures at the time because I was working with a number of their customers. And we started Cauldron. We incorporated Cauldron and we did a management led buyout of agri-technology. So now we have the IP, we have the physical assets and the business assets out of that company. Okay. So there should be clear to people in our audience that you're clearly not American. I said you're in Australia. You said you moved to the country, paint a picture of where you were and where you had to move to. So yes, I have a very thick Australian accent of actually people who struggle to understand me. I grew up in the country or the outback and basically went to Sydney for my education. So I went to Sydney, became educated, but Ultimately, I'm a country girl at heart, so I wanted to find a way to get back to the country. So Orange is where we're based. It's a company called Orange. We grow apples in Orange, and it is 260 kilometers west of Sydney. So we relocated out there and started working for agri-technology, and we raise cattle in, in my spare time and live on a farm and have this amazing precision fermentation plant in the middle of a winery. It's incredible. You should come and visit. Yeah, I would love that. So you mentioned Main Sequence Ventures. I've known Phil Morrill of Main Sequence for a really long time. And we met at Symbio Beta, have always had great conversations. And I do remember early on, one of our conversations that I repeated to many people was that as Australia was looking to begin the production of precision fermented products, particularly in the dairy industry, they were going to start using the fermenters that were dormant in the wine industry. So I, I think Phil said that that was going to happen. I don't know if it ever did, but I was fascinated by that idea. And I've told that story over and over again to other people in Spain and in California, because we know that these fermentation facilities, for example, in the wine country of wherever, aren't being used all year round. But that is traditional fermentation. That's before Phil met me. <laughs> So it was an amazing vision, and I think that there's still something to be said for that. But I like precision fermentation, so we're talking about aseptic, aerobic fermenters. I liken them to the F1 car when the wine fermenters are really the Citron or the Renault Clios of the world. They're very different machines. But in saying that, we do have a philosophy where we are going to build manufacturing capacity aligned with agribusinesses, and there is a lot of underutilised capital in the world. So we're talking about DSP or even if it's a tank that we could utilize. If there's a value to be created by aligning with these companies, then that's something we're looking at doing. But unfortunately, red wine fermenters will not ever grow precision fermentation microbes. They're just not fast enough. And you say DSP meaning downstream processing? Absolutely. So the filtration, then those sorts of things. Yeah. Now, the way you told me the story when we first met or when we met with Phil in San Francisco was that Cauldron has really developed to solve a very real need in the Australian biotech industry. What's the biotech industry like in Australia and what is the need that Cauldron solves? 
So there is an emerging biotechnology industry. We've got a number of well-funded startups. For a small country, we have 55 SynBio startups that have been funded, about $360 million worth of funding. The CSIRO, our Commonwealth Research Agency, and the federal government itself have identified precision fermentation as a technology front runner for Australia because we have a lot of things that precision fermentation needs. We're very similar to Midwest USA. We have a lot of water. We have a lot of sun. We have feedstock. We have great geopolitical positioning in Australia. I think there's only two countries in the world we don't have free trade agreement with. And also IP. We have a great IP framework and a great R&D network. So that's what we have down in Australia and that's what we're looking to capitalise on. But of course, this is a global problem and we're not going to feed the world or clothe the world from Australia alone. So Cauldron does have global ambitions and we're actively working with a number of governments internationally to see where we can stand up at these manufacturing facilities. I love that. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that if you can, because this idea of distributed biomanufacturing are really interesting to me personally, I think to people who listen to the podcast, but how does Cauldron fit into that idea of distributed biomanufacturing? What would that look like? I think distributed biomanufacturing is more likely given Cauldron's model because we have this hyperfermentation, which is anywhere between five to 12 times more efficient then our fed batch fermentation, the incumbent model, we can build smaller, smarter facilities. And, you know, Power Bio are looking to do the same thing. Smaller facilities gets the same with more product coming out of them, lower capital costs, which really lends itself to bolt-on facilities with existing feedstock providers or people with underutilized capitals and a distributed model. So we, for example, have six clients. We could actually have facilities in six different locations or 10 different locations. We don't need to build two to four million litre factories to get cost of goods. I listened to Edward's podcast this morning and that's the volume they were starting to look at. And obviously he's trying to drive that down, but we don't need to build mega factories, we can just build these smaller, smarter factories, which lends itself to decentralization. So you mentioned Edward's podcast. Edward is a previous episode, Edward Shinderovich of Synonym. And they are talking about these, correct me if I'm wrong, multi-million liter facilities. When you say that you don't need to build something that big, give me a picture. How many liters is it? And what does it look like? So the narrative is that for biomanufactured goods to reach, let's call it $15 a kilo, they need to be in 500,000 litre fermenters or four to 500,000 litre fermenters. And we're talking about for a factory to have multiple of those factors is hundreds of millions of dollars. We can get equivalent product out of 100,000 litre, well, not equivalent, we can get more product out of a 100,000 litre fermentation facility, which drives down the capex. We're running at about 40% of a very conservative batch manufacturing build cost. So we can just build these smaller facilities. And of course, 100,000 litre facilities, we can lend itself to dedicated facilities as well. So we're not trying to share facilities between customers. We can provide our customers with dedicated lines because the capex is so low. From a physical infrastructure point of view, paint a picture of what that looks like. What does a 100,000 litre facility look like? (laughs) Still lots of shiny stainless steel tanks. It looks like a silo. We're talking about grain silos instead of these hulking monstrosities that our our fermenters may be 14 metres tall instead of needing to be 30 metres tall, things like that. And ultimately, these quite sophisticated smaller facilities with lines of little tanks. So what I'm picturing is, you say a grain silo, so that's the way I can definitely picture that. But I'm also trying to figure out, I'm in Brooklyn, there's a brewery down the street from us, other half, Mm -hmm. very famous US-based brewery, probably has, let's say, eight steel tanks that they're brewing beer out of to supply a bunch of places. Do you have an idea of how many liters those might be? Is there a standard? My understanding comes from my co-founder, David Kessenbaum, has come from AB InBev. My understanding is that the largest beer fermenters are about a million litres. So we're talking about a tenth of the size. But then I think standard would be 500,000, 250,000 to 500,000 litres. So that's what batch needs. We're smaller again. When you're talking to AmBev, they're talking about these assembly lines that are putting out a thousand cans a minute. I'm talking about my microbrewery down the street. How many liters, you know, capacity do you think those guys have? I'm just trying to paint a picture for the people in the audience. When I think about distributed biomanufacturing, I'm always like, what's it going to look like in my neighborhood? Is it going to look like one of these microbrews? 
fundamentally it'll still be in the Midwest. It'll be co-located with corn or it will be co-located with some sort of energy park. So it probably won't be in your downtown neighborhood. But ultimately it will be a warehouse, but it will have tanks out the side. The tanks will probably be 12 meters high, five meters wide. I don't know that for sure. So do not come back to me, people, and tell me that I changed my mind. And it'll be a line of five to six tanks. Nice shiny steel tanks. Actually, they'll be branded with cauldron logos. And that's what they will look like. We really want people to be driving through the Midwest and go, oh, that's where our egg white stuff is made. Just like the craft factory or like an Arnott's factory. Like, oh, that's just a cauldron plant. We want it to be so normalized that it's just, oh, there's another factory. Hi, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Messaging Lab, the force multiplier for biotech. Your biotech company is making the world a better place. You know that, we know that. But does the world? There's a big reason why some biotech companies attract investors, sign up customers, and get attention. That reason is strategic communications. At Messaging Lab, we translate complex science and economics into compelling narratives. And we have done that for the most successful biotech companies across healthcare, agriculture, personal care and beauty, materials, and the list goes on. We're here to make sure your ideas not only get heard, but resonate with your audience. So if it's time to amplify your company's voice, visit messaginglab.com to explore how we can elevate your story and grow your business. Yeah, and I mean, you say in the Midwest where cost of goods are probably significantly cheaper. But like we are not far in Brooklyn from one of the big Anheuser-Busch breweries on the other side of the rivers in New Jersey. And so you drive by there. So I can imagine that at some point there would be a cauldron facility or several cauldron facilities that we could look at here on the East Coast. And we could say the same thing. Oh, that's where they're producing that new nylon. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. I'm not particularly familiar with the geography in your area of the world. but. <laughs> If there's large food production facilities, it's likely we can put a culture in there. Oh, yeah. No, there is some really big production facilities. And upstate New York, you have to support mm. this city of 10 million. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, upstate New York are all places where this kind of fermentation facility can happen. And I'm also under the impression that upstate New York, Rochester, on the Great Lakes is where Kodak was. And I'm under the impression that they've got a precision fermentation facility that's been built there. I don't know what it looks like. We need to find out and I'll do my homework and get back to you and let you know. I was at an airport, Sydney airport, talking to a whole bunch of guys from Kodak and they were talking about their biomanufacturing facilities that they were building. It was very, very interesting, but I'm not sure. It's probably a pharmaceutical facility. But I'd be very clear, we do have a US agenda. I have a US co-founder and he is very, very au fait with all of this. So it's not that Cauldron doesn't understand the geography. It's just that I don't understand geography. Okay, yeah, I know you're in a good place. So one of the things that stood out for me is you guys have developed this proprietary high fermentation technology. You said it's like developed in the 70s, which is amazing to me because I've been on a kick for the last few weeks where there's all these technologies that were developed 30, 40 years ago that have not seen the light of day. But one of the things that I know about Cauldron is you guys have developed solutions for genetic drift and unwanted contamination. What do those things mean and what's your solution for them? So let's talk about genetic drift. So continuous fermentation, we grow our microbes for a lot longer than people do in batch fermentation. They pretty much just run their bugs through one lifetime, then use them to create protein. So sad. So sad. Poor old fellas and ladies. <laughs> So as I said before, we really hold them at this most productive indefinite state. So they may be teenagers or they may be in their 30s or 40s. It depends on where we're about in their life cycle, they're the most productive. But what the narrative is, because we're turning these cells over and constantly creating a new population of cells, that they may actually lose the genetic elements that encode the molecule. We do see that when you do repeated fed batches, you take them to the full lifespan, then grow them again, you do see them shifting in genetic elements just because they're not the most healthy cells by the time they get to the end of the batch. Because we hold them at this most productive phase, we're seeing that there is no reduction in the genetic stability of those cells. So those cells aren't switching off or I like to call it spitting the genetic elements. So they can still continue to create the same amount of protein as they would have in a batch fermentation. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, no, I'm going to repeat it back to you and to make sure that I understand it, because it is one of those things that I think about when I think about fermentation. You've basically taken a strain of yeast and you've engineered it to produce a particular protein. Now, given that yeast exists in a natural state, it's going to evolve and potentially could evolve back to the state that initially existed in before you force it to produce this protein. And I shouldn't say force, you're coaxing it. The concern is that it will eventually evolve back to the state that it was in. But you guys have come up with a way so that doesn't happen. Is that correct? Yes. And evolution is driven by negative conditions. So something will have to evolve to overcome a problem. So if it's going to evolve or devolve back to its natural state, it's because it's under some sort of pressure. Our technology has been developed to keep these cells at their happiest, so there's no reason for them to evolve or devolve. Keep them happy and they'll keep working. Keep them fed and they'll yep. keep producing the proteins. Yeah. And you guys are only using yeast, though. What's the possibility of using other microorganisms? Oh, we've got also a filamentous fungi platform as well, but that's for an enriched biomass. Ultimately, we believe that filamentous fungi and pickier will accounts for 70 to 80 percent of the TAM when it comes to the food industry. As I said, we're only incorporated in November 2022. So we are about low but laser focus. We've seen people lose focus and lose their businesses. So we are laser focused, greatest TAM best technology we can get, and then always looking with partnerships. We have partnerships with a number of strain developers. What's next? But at the moment, it's just about pickier. And yes, we do methanol. That's a question we always ask. We're willing to do methanol. I believe it's not the way of the future, but at the moment, what I need to do is I need to be able to stand at Sin Bio Beta in 2026 and throw kilograms of product into the crowd and say, keep it, it's only worth $9 a kilo. That's what Cauldron has to do before we move on to the next step because without that, the industry and the market will never be realized. And when you say, yes, we can do methanol, you mean feeding the bugs that, right? Yes. So these microbes are engineered. So when you feed them glucose, for example, they just create more of themselves. They're creating more factories. And once you take the glucose away and put methanol in, then they go, okay, it's time to start creating the molecule. And that's just a very tried and true method of switching the product production phase on. However, there's some amazing companies out there that are looking at methanol-free methods, and we're working alongside those companies because that will be the future. I have to say that when we first met and you told me this story, I was so excited because I'm a huge fan of this distributed biomanufacturing, and I've just been waiting for someone to come along and do exactly what you guys are doing. So I can't wait to see your facilities all over the place. Now, what about contamination? Because that's always something that people wonder about. How did your bioreactors avoid contamination? So we have a number of steps to avoid contamination and some of it's through our proprietary media and some of it's through how we actually run the ferment. So there's a number of bioprocesses that we combine. That's why we call it hyperfermentation, not just continuous fermentation. And we have those media for the commercial chassis. We have them for E. coli. We have it for Pickia. We have it for filamentous fungus. We have it for microalgae. So we have it for a number of commercial strains. What we had been doing at Agrotechnology since 2011 is continuous fermentation with Pickia at 10,000 litres in a commercial setting without contamination. So we've done over 20 campaigns, greater than three months in length. Our longest fermentation was eight months and 24 days. And we only shut that down, not because it got contaminated, because it was Christmas and we all wanted to spend time with our families. We believe 10,000 litres is an industrially relevant scale. It wasn't in a beautiful lab where we all wear lab coats. It was out in the winter and here in Orange we get snow. The fermenter's in the snow or it's in the hot temperatures. We've run these fermenters outside. It's very industrial and we've done that for a very long time. So we're confident that we have overcome that contamination risk. We've proved it time and time again with commercial products that we shift around the world. I am less concerned about contamination than the industry, only because I've done it day in and day out for the last 12 years. That's amazing. So let's go back and do some big picture stuff. You said you're focused on feeding the world. How does Cauldron's technology contribute to that and contribute to sustainability? When we talk about food, it's because I have a personal bent for food security. I was doing my PhD one day and I was formulating the feed and I realized that we're feeding the pigs the same thing that I was eating and why are we doing this and how is this sustainable? So I was a young whippersnapper who realized that we had a food insecurity problem coming our way. 
we talk about food, but our platform is across a number of verticals. We have customers in food, we have the customers in nutraceuticals, when we have customers in fuels. So we can work along a number of things, a number of platforms. We're speaking to a number of materials customers as well. So it's a platform technology that's across verticals. We believe that the conventional methods of manufacturing food are not sustainable. I think you know, there's a lot of reports out there saying to feed a population of 10 billion people, we need it another planet. We don't have another planet B. So we need to find a new way to do that. And we believe that this industry, and I'll be very clear, we don't have strains. We work with strain and product companies. We are just the manufacturer. We believe that they have create incredible alternatives to existing food ingredients. And we think we can do that. Now, there's been a plenty of LCAs done for these industries across the world where we're seeing huge reductions in in greenhouse gas emissions associated with precision fermentation compared to conventional agriculture. Cauldron, again, improves on top of that because we are more productive than the incumbent method that they've based that on. We believe that we can produce products. We believe there's food scarcity coming and we believe that we can maintain planetary health, which is super important to all of us. I remember reading a book, and it may have even been written by an Australian, that was called The Coming Famine, which is a horrifying book, but it talks about climate, but just talked about other things that we're going to factor into the ability to have enough food for everyone. And these are things like loss of habitat, over-fertilization, loss of agricultural land that we've already using, what the water issue, which affects every continent and not to mention the growth of the population. So mm-hmm. clearly we need a lot of alternatives to be able to feed the growing population and things that are not dependent on the crop cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Weather is becoming less predictable and we're seeing that. We certainly I feel like Australia may be the little dove or pigeon that you send into the mine, if you know what I mean. I feel like we here in Australia and particularly in the Southeast Asia, we experience climate change probably more so or we probably seeing it before everyone else. Less predictable, growing population, but also, yeah, as you say, urban encroachment on farming land. That's a huge issue here in Australia. There's a multi-factor is going to lead to this and humans aren't going to change. We're a voracious being and we want things and we want to continue the way that we're going. So we need to find a way that we can continue to feed the world and their overconsumption. It was very interesting. I was at Rethinking Materials after I left Symbio Beta, where I met you. I was talking to a company who was developing fibers for materials and they had two options because they can engineer these things how they want. I said, are you designing for durability or are you designing for biodegradability? And they went, fast fashion is not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. So we're designing for biodegradability, which makes me really sad. But I think this is a testament to the human appetite for things. And we need to find a better way to keep that going because we won't change until something horrible happens. Yeah. I mean, you went to Rethink Materials and I go to Biofabricate almost every other year. And the fashion industry is guilty of overproducing. I think on the shoe side of the world, they produce enough shoes for every person on the planet four times over every year. And that's completely unsustainable. And I don't need four pairs of shoes every year. One of the biggest challenges for biotech companies is always this ability to transition from lab scale to commercial scale. We were just writing about this for a client. They have a very special molecule. They've been very successful with it. But that transition to the bigger production, whether that's a thousand liters or 10,000 liters, is very challenging. What does Calder do to overcome that? That's interesting that you mentioned that because. The benefit I had by having worked with another of these companies before I started Cauldron is I could see really the valleys of the death, what they need to raise, raise, ultimately raise the next round. So what we've done is we've developed our agreement with these companies to overcome a lot of those things. So we work with our customers in a three-phase agreement where we first test them at LubScape and say, do you fit our platform? That's called FirmaFit. And then we have a second phase, which is really for Series B companies where we start, we call the, everything's got a lovely name. And that's where we really work with them at 10,000 litres. And we do batch fermentations for them and we do hyper fermentations for them. We do a techno economic evaluation for them. And we prove that our technology will get them to the cost of goods. And at that point, they will have the confidence 
to continue to manufacture and move on to one of our manufacturing facilities with us. And we do that in a phase three, which we call Firma Grow. So these companies aren't coming to us with a strain and going, oh, can you please grow this? We have a one and a half year relationship where they know this is going to work and it gives them confidence to move into our manufacturing facilities. Firma Fit is for seed round companies. Firma Validates really Series A, Series B companies and Firma Grow is for Series B Series C companies. So we've really tailored it for this entrepreneurial startup ecosystem. So it really sounds like if I'm Iram and I start a biotech company tomorrow and we need to produce, we should be talking to you fairly early on so that we can make sure that what we're producing is going to fit the model for scale up. Absolutely. And we have relationships with people. It's interesting. You talk to scientists and I am a scientist, so I can talk about scientists and they'll sit there and go, you know, we really need to optimize our media. We've got to spend a million dollars optimizing our media when ultimately it contributes percentage points in the overall cost of goods. So we try to get in early with these customers so they're not wasting, but spending their very small amounts of money, which are getting smaller in this climate at the moment on things that matter. But we have relationships with Boston Bioprocess, so Michael Tai and his team here in the US, and then we also have a relationship with Biobase EU. So they're really working with us in developing these processes that can fit into Cauldron's model. So that's a really exciting opportunity. So go and talk to them or talk to us early, but that's the key to everything. And I think I really picture a horizontal ecosystem, like companies have had to do their own strain development. They've had to build their own manufacturing capacity because the ecosystem didn't exist, but things are starting to come through. If I was to start a product company, I'd just go to one of the strain developing companies and say, help me. I wouldn't have a team of 60 scientists. I would just be using these amazing service providers all across the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I really want us to do this to just prove that all this stuff can be done basically virtually. We want to create a molecule that does X. We hire the team that does a strain engineering for us. And then we come to you and we say, can you scale this while at the same time already having the customers in place? I think it offers companies really a way to move way faster than they might normally have even thought was possible. Because I think that This idea of scaling production, having to build those facilities yourself and the cost associated with that is really probably going to continue to hold a lot of people back. And VCs aren't going to support that anymore. If you look, a lot of the VCs are creating these specialist manufacturers for that reason. Agronomics has liberation labs, Blue Horizon with planetary and main sequence in Cauldron. So that even the investors themselves are positioning a horizontal ecosystem. So what are you most excited about? You've done a lot. It's been a short, exciting run. What are you most excited about right now? And what are you looking forward to in the future? Building our first biofab. So it's well and truly in train. We've got a number of options, which is very excited, which I'm not at liberty to discuss at the moment. So that's very exciting for us because ultimately 10,000 litres is where we're comfortable. That's what we're doing and we've been doing for a very long time. But until I get it into a 100,000 litre fermenter, I cannot get those cost of goods. So with existing strains at the moment, Cauldron will get these customers to $18 a kilo. And then as we see the improvements in strain, which we see every day with every single one of our customers, that's where we're looking at that $9 per kilo. But we can't do that without our biofab. And that's what we're most excited about. From an industry perspective, I just want someone to have enough production to secure these offtake agreements and we can start seeing things in products, which I don't think in the first instance we're going to know that a lot of these things are coming through, like egg whites will go into baked goods or lipids will go into slices of cheese and we won't even know it, but the industry will know it. And that's what's really exciting for me because my concern is without the investment, we'll drop off and humanity needs this. Yeah, absolutely. How do you think what you guys are doing is really going to shape the future of biomanufacturing? What's the ultimate vision? I think what we are going to do and even what we are doing at the moment is we're changing the narrative. I think since in BioBeta, I've seen three articles where people have talked about continuous fermentation. You know, originally, no, everyone wouldn't even entertain it. First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. We're beyond laughing. Now we're in fighting. I was just that crazy woman in Australia who thinks that she can do continuous fermentation. So I think shifting the narrative, and I think we're early enough in the industry that people are looking at ways to revolutionize biomanufacturing. Like 
I think people are looking at better ways, better DSP, better feed stocks, things like that. I think we're seeing that very early in our industry. So I think that's what we're looking to do is challenge the narrative, what needs to be true to get to cost parity. And that's the way we're looking at it now instead of going, oh, we're just going to have to charge more because that ultimately doesn't work. So I think that's what Cauldron are doing. And then ultimately we want these things all around the world. We want to be producing food globally and we want to be producing better food and better products around the world. That's what we're looking to do. That's world domination. Yeah, let's go. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's where we should end this because that is the message. Cauldron World Domination (laughs) Tour. Well, was there anything that we didn't cover that we should have? Let me just ask that question. It's really important to Cauldron and particularly the Australian ecosystem. Cauldron are not competitive with conventional agriculture. As I said before, I am a beef farmer. I have a farm with lots of little cows. But we think there needs to be a complementary way to manufacture food and fiber and fuel. So we're not competing with conventional agriculture. We like to see ourselves complementary and way of overcoming potential scarcity that comes through. I think that makes perfect sense. One of the things that I'd heard repeatedly from people working in the cultivated meat space was that many of the people from the beef industry couldn't wait for cultivated meat to show up on the market because then they could move away from the factory farming that they've been forced into by the marketplace. And they could move into a place where they were much more sustainable in terms of the way that they were growing beef. So I'm really looking forward to what you guys are doing. I can't tell you how excited I am. It's an exciting time. Can't wait. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. So, Carl, what did you think about interviewing Michelle? I wasn't able to be there, unfortunately. Wasn't feeling well, but what were some key takeaways? Well, I think we said it at the beginning of the year that biomanufacturing was going to be one of our themes for 2024 and beyond. And as we've discussed on the podcast several times, biomanufacturing and the ability to create new biomanufacturing centers are going to become like the new data centers. This is what Edward Shenderovich of Synonym talked about when we interviewed him. And what I'm seeing is there's a lot of interest from infrastructure investors and Midwestern in the United States investors as well. They're seeing that we grow all this corn, all this corn can be turned into feedstock for biomanufacturing. So I think it's a very, very compelling opportunity. That's the big picture. In terms of Michelle and Cauldron, I was fascinated by the fact that the hyperfermentation technology was developed in the 1970s or 80s. And it really makes me wonder how much technology is out there from that time that has yet to be developed or commercialized. I bet there's a lot. Oh, yeah. I thought about that a lot just in terms of, you know, how hard it is to start a company or get something commercialized. The number is 9% of companies fail. And there's so many different variables that cause a failure of a product to get to market. This reminds me of the battle between Edison and Tesla to get an electricity infrastructure out into the world because Edison had more access to politicians, government, the copper industry to do copper wiring, came up with a very lucrative business model that more people were interested in versus free energy for all from Tesla. That is what actually spearheaded. And so we live in this infrastructure where it is copper wired electricity, right? But is there a parallel universe where free electricity is just floating in the air? That is very curious. I'm also wondering what other biotechnologies are just sitting there or still getting commercialized, but need more funding or need more people or need that one extra piece of technology to unlock it that then we can have access to it. So this is what you and I and people in the biotech industry are looking at and what we'd like to bring to our listeners, what is being commercialized. So that's great that you had this conversation, Michelle. What other things stood out to you? One of the things that really stood out for me is Cauldron's global ambitions. Michelle said that initially they're focused on the United States. And she even said, what I'm looking forward to is being able to drive down a highway and see a Cauldron logo on a biomanufacturing facility. So I really appreciate that global ambition from, a let's just say, small company, recently funded company, because we're going to need biomanufacturing everywhere. And if we're able to standardize it, 
the way mm-hmm. that Edward Shinderovich talked about it, the way that Michelle talks about it, then we make it more accessible. And we know we need this. This is something that's going to be necessary to transform the way we feed the population, the way we clothe the population, the way that we make materials. So I mm-hmm. am super inspired by Michelle and her global ambitions. And I just think that that's the way to go. I'm looking forward to having the bioreactor in Industry City that I know that if I want to buy some Wagyu beef, I have a choice between paying $50 a steak or $25 or $20 a steak from the Industry City bioreactor printed you know, beef. So I want Michelle and the biomanufacturing companies that we've featured on the podcast to succeed as quickly as possible. And I think we're at an inflection point for biomanufacturing. I think there's a lot of opportunity. And that said, I'd like to get someone to come on and talk about the opposite, how there's not enough products to use all the infrastructure that we're going to put in place so that we can hear the funded side of it. And I have a couple of people in mind who will argue the other side of this argument. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing on either side of that is cost. That's the number one elephant in the room is, can you be competitive with these existing products that are made with by traditional extractive processes or petrochemicals? How do we get the cost down or make the higher cost acceptable? It's an interesting marketing challenge for us, I think, you know, just upselling. There's hamburger meat, that's probably 50 cents. But then there's Wagyu beef that tastes delicious. That is $25 a pound. And people are paying for that. Not a lot of people. Cost is the big thing, I think, when it comes to anything that's body manufactured or commercialized. And so that's a big part of the question that I'm excited to explore with you and our guests. Right. So just a couple of quick announcements to close out the episode. If you haven't checked us out on YouTube, all these episodes are now being posted on YouTube and we're seeing some nice growth on there. If you go on YouTube and you enjoy the podcast, please do us a favor and hit the like button. I've always wanted to say that. Hit the like button and subscribe. That really is important for us and for the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we want to thank all of our Patreons. This is something new that we've been doing. We have a great community being built out. We want to thank one of our newest Patreons, Kiara from Rice University. We also had the pleasure of hanging out with at Beta. She is such a joy, so intelligent, so fun. I'd say sister from another mister. We had a great time. So thank you, Kiara, for being a Patreon member. Kiara and I were texting each other and her partner, Cole, just gave a talk at the seed conference and I was blown away because I was like, wait, I need to look up what this mean. Apparently Cole's thesis was on consortia ratio control using orthogonal autotrophs. And I was like, wait, what? (laughs) So I needed to go and look that up. Cole, if you want to come up on and explore that with us and explain what that means, we'd love to hear it so that our Grow Everything audience gets smarter. That's incredible. Yep. Yep, there's a lot out there in biology and we're bringing it to you through the Grab Everything podcast. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned for the next episode. That's the pod.